very big welcome to you all, and thank you so much for persevering because I gather parking was a little bit long tonight because there's a graduation going on. So I wouldn't be surprised if you people can, you know, arrive and sort of drift in. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll get going, which will be really nice. I've got lots of new faces tonight, which is great, and actually Robert's a new face as well. So I'm going to introduce her in a minute. So um, just a word of uh, so, do, um, if you want to, during the evening, get up and get drinks and help yourselves to things. So this is quite an informal event, hopefully. Um, it's events that the Centre for Coaching and Mentoring um, have been running now for a couple of months, and we're trying to run sort of one or two of them every month. We're calling them Talking Tuesdays. Um, and they really are aimed at a very wide audience of people. So if you're sitting there wondering if this is the right place to be, and it's for you, I hope it is. Um, you know, it really is for people who both might call themselves a coach or a mentor, equally to someone who just, it is a small aspect of their working life, or perhaps even not at the moment, but something they might be interested in developing. So, um, these events, if you want to find out more about them, I think um, many of you I know actually are already members of the online network, which is lovely, so you'll, you'll see those things there. Please, by the way, even though I put up there and say, you know, you can too. The idea of that network is not a one-way conversation. I'm not trying to just make it dominated by what I'm thinking. So um, please put things up. If you've got things coming up, I'd love to hear about them. And you know about them or if you're, you know, linked to someone else, that'd be brilliant. So connect, engage, and create. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to do with the help of Roma. And Roma here is a very quick bio that I might introduce. You can see some quite impressive things on there. Straight away standing out in Radio Verulam. So, uh, Roma, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you did for Radio Verulam, Roma. Um, well, up until last month, I was on their main board, and they're a social enterprise. Um, and I spent two years on their main board, working specifically around with a focus on strategy. Um, sorry, I should stand up so I can see everyone. Um, working specifically around strategy, and um, also I'm a presenter for the business programme, which we started as a bit of an experiment in September, and actually, um, Kathy's a co-presenter, well, co-presenter on another, not on the business show, another <laughs> presenter, but... Um, we'll give, we'll definitely give a little. Yeah, it's unexpectedly gained ground in that we've got the business community engaged in a big way, We've also had PR companies contacting us to ask whether we can get their business clients on. So yeah, it's kind of gaining ground. And for me, it's another angle to what I do, engaging with business. No, no, no. So what, when is that program? Sundays, 8 till 9 o'clock. 8 till 9, 92.6 FM. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got it right, because yeah. I say it wrong. But, and I know that because Kathy there, Kathy Weston, is, um, uh, is what do you call yourself? Your program presenter. Present. Present okay the parent show which is on Thursday night eight till nine, which I know rather a lot about that because I seem to get clicked into it quite a lot. So we're talking about bizarre things which we won't go into. <laughs> but anyway, Radio Verum is a great local radio station. It's situated in St Albans yes. and um, it's very vibrant and it's great because I know you've been very instrumental in getting things going there. So that's fantastic. But interesting enough for this evening, although we are interested in the radio station too, but we're very interested in your other career, which is to do with coaching. Mm -hmm. Now you work here part time, but you also, yeah, uh, and, but you're also and have been for quite a long time uh, a very established um, coach, and you have a particular expertise, which is really what you're going to be talking about this evening. So that's really exciting. So um, I will hand over. Thank you. And, so the idea is, Roma, the session will last, oh, I don't know, about uh, 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. And that will leave about 10 minutes at the end, perhaps, for us to share some of the, perhaps anything that we know that's coming up, any um, events that you know that you're doing, or you know, that you'd like to tell us about, it would be really nice. And uh, we'll call it a day. Pick me up now. I'm not as a parachute, you see. No, no. <laughs> Okay, so um, just a very brief um, overview in terms of agenda. The, the first thing I wanted to say was that this is not a lecture. I'm not going to be teaching anyone to be a coach. Um, the idea, as Sally uh, said to me, was would I come along and share my experience? And actually, I want to hear about your experiences as coaches too. 
Um, so I'm very much sharing my experience as a practitioner, although as I'm thinking about it, apologies to the academics in the room. One of the things I've realised is whilst I've put references on one of my slides, I haven't then put references at the end. And that's very bad. Very bad. Very bad. Yes, exactly. Parachute <laughs> jumping. <laughs> So then um, I'll be looking at typical clients, giving you an overview of some of the typical clients I'm working with currently and have been recently, um, some typical issues that they tend to face, which is interesting in the context of coaching. Um, my role as coach, mentor, business collaborator, and I've put those there as titles very deliberately, um, and the question mark very deliberately, because my experience has been interesting to say the least. When does coaching become consultancy is something I constantly hit, so we'll talk a bit about that. And learning as a concept in its own right, what I learn, what they learn, I'm very keen to look at learning and I'll talk a little bit about that and then obviously time for questions at the end. I'll try not to kill you with PowerPoint slides, I'll be whizzing through some of them. Um, and I realise that might be a little bit difficult to see, but if I briefly explain, I'm just giving you a little flavour of clients typically I've just either finished with or I'm working with currently. So I've got everything from, and, and the issues, sorry, that they, they have in terms of achieving high growth. Um, and I should have said, sorry, in, at the moment I'm currently working with what are known as high growth organisations. What that means is that realistically they're looking at a very aggressive growth strategy over a three to five year period. And I'll say more about that in a moment. They're all established companies. So I've got everything from a PR organisation, a million turnover, City of London based. They're looking at a strategy of globalisation. They've won a couple of very key, they're in fashion, they've won a couple of very key clients um, overseas and they're looking at representation out there. Um, engineering maintenance company, which was very different for, for me, six million turnover. I came into working with them um, off the back of a management buy-in. The um, original owner exited the business, the senior managers and directors bought the business out, and they then looked at moving it from a three million to a six million turnover business in three years, which they achieved. So that was an interesting journey. A security services business, uh, 3 million turnover, looking at strategy of diversification. Currently, they look at security services, but they're diversifying into um, fire safety. Um, IT, which is a very interesting organisation. Can't say too much about them. They're in IT, but they've gone from a standing start to 43 million in six years. And they're looking at um, selling the business in three to four years' time. Um, financial services organisation, 3 million turnover again, they've taken advantage of some regulation changes and they're looking at growth through acquisition and again they've got a very aggressive acquisition strategy in three years time they look to again um, sell the business. And finally an aviation based organisation um, who have clients around the world um, and a 2 million turnover business, they were interesting because it was a, a sector that was traditionally privatised, uh, sorry, a public sector organisation, they've gone through privatisation, they've got a new chief executive in place that's taking a board who come from the original organisation through quite, as you can imagine, quite a significant cultural change as much as um, literal change from public sector to private organisation. So as I say, they're typically clients I'm working with. What do we mean by the, the, the high growth organisation? Realistically, they're looking at anything upwards of 20% year on year growth, which you don't have to be great at maths to know in this particular economic climate is one hell of a feat to achieve. Um, they're looking at aggressive three to five year growth plans. Um, they are all established, so they are three years plus in terms of um, existence. They're not startups. And they, they're going through what I call phases. So, in some cases, the, the engineering company was actually established in 1968. They've gone through what I would call four versions of the organisation. And if you look back to 1968, you wouldn't recognise the organisation at all. They've gone through quite significant changes they've gone through another phase of that growth. Um, they all, in common, they all have a dynamic head within the organisation, either at managing director or chief exec level, who are very focused on results. 
usually a good thing. As coaches, you probably know sometimes not necessarily a good thing from the perspective of cultural change within the organisation, where the results become the focus and kind of other things go out the door. Um, they are all doing what we call buck the trend. They're all bucking the trend of their industry sector in the context of the current market. Um, they're doing significantly better than others, and it's always interesting to look at why they're doing so well. Um, I, one of the things I'm also doing here at the university part-time is um, a doctorate, um, and my area of research is um, particularly around strategy and networks. I'm particularly interested in how high growth organisations use networks and networking to facilitate that accelerated growth. Um, so looking at this issue of bucking the trend in the context of strategy and networking has been very interesting. All my clients, have all, they're all aware that I'm doing a doctorate and they've all, as it happens, agreed to be part of my research. So it's also helped inform my research. Interestingly, a lot of them have been very cynical about support. Um, and in a previous life, for four years, I was a business advisor with Business Link. Um, I didn't deal with startups, I dealt with established organisations. And Business Link has a little bit of a negative reputation because it's very fragmented in the service it delivers around the UK. Um, there are some Business Links who use public sector organisation based employees who've never run businesses. Um, without fail here in the east of England, we were all recruited on the basis that we had run or started our own business in both. So I've had two businesses, one of which was in technology and was high growth. Um, but yes, this idea of being cynical about support has again, has again presented some interesting challenges as a coach sometimes, and yet they've invited me in to work with them. Um, they're keen to share and learn. So once I break down, in some cases, that initial potential barrier, um, they, they become quite keen to share and learn. And there's very much a reciprocal sharing and learning. And I feel that's very, very important from my perspective as a coach. And that's where we come back to this idea of coach, mentor, collaborator, where do you sit, as it were, in the relationship. They have high expectations. And, we, and as a result, I find it critical that I set the boundaries. And often we're revisiting the boundaries. Um, sorry, if I'm rushing too much, then let me know. <laughs> so some typical issues. Um, at the core, I'm there to review strategy with them and very much focus around the reality check. Clearly, they're already very successful. Otherwise, they wouldn't be classified as high growth. They wouldn't be on this aggressive program of change. Um, so it's an interesting journey because I'm going into a situation where they've already maintained this huge um, uh, growth. Um, so that's been very interesting also. Um, who's in charge? Issues of changing. I've put that there for a couple of reasons. The who's in charge applies to going into the organisation I'm engaging with the managing director or chief executive in the first instance and then invariably working with the rest of the board. Within the context of the majority of those organisations, in the process of this growth that they're going through, they also have tended to recruit at senior level more expertise because of course as they grow, as we all know, there are areas of the business that they may not have in-house expertise for. So they bring in additional people. And what usually seems to ensue is this tussle as far as um, power is concerned. And I think it's all traditional stuff, isn't it? It's traditional change management stuff. But essentially, there, there's some interesting tussles that go on at board level that I've experienced. And um, what I find is that I often end up as the confidant. And I think I've also put that in there. You know, again, this kind of many faces as a coach almost. Sometimes I feel a bit schizophrenic. <laughs> um, but that interesting dynamic again, you know, again having to remind them of boundaries because at the end of the day, if you're there under the auspices of working, say, with the chief exec or the MD, and you're having information thrown at you around how certain people feel, etc., there's all sorts of interesting things that come into play. Um, and also in the context of management structures, how that impacts. Um, skills and 
competencies. Um, as we're moving quite rapidly, clearly there are skills and competencies that need to be developed, and particularly in the context of the managing director and the chief exec. They, they recognise what once we start going through the process of one-to-one -one coaching, that there are potentially some holes there that need to be filled. Um, and I have to say, sometimes I won't fill those gaps depending on the relationship, the situation, what I'm there to do. What I sometimes suggest they do, it's been relevant to refer them on to people like the Institute of Directors, mm. where actually what they need is some statutory training, because that's kind of been the missing link, the missing, missing time. Or I may suggest that they go external very deliberately so we can just focus on strategy. I'm capable of doing soft skills coaching, but sometimes it's been appropriate for me to just focus on strategy. Um, this issue of ever-changing culture, you know, in the process of, with some organisations I've been working with them for four years, some of them I've only been working with for four months, they're new relationships, um, but because the culture's changing, what's being thrown up, going back to this where does my role sit, what's being thrown up are lots of conversations around Right, actually, we recognise that we're going to need some training in this, our managers are going to need that, we need to view such and such. And so what I'm finding is we're also having conversations around what I can do to help with training and developing senior managers. And again, what I'm choosing to do, and you guys can tell me if it's right or wrong, is to say, well look, here's the framework of what I've come in to do, and let's work with this piece. I will talk to you about what else I can do off the side of that, but then we need everything kind of very clearly marked and timelines for things so that there's clarity and there's clear boundaries. I'm obsessed about the boundaries because my nervousness is always, if the boundaries become blurred, then you potentially lose value in, in terms of um, being able to look at what value you gain from the coach and the results. Um, but also there could be potential misunderstanding. And, and from a practical perspective, what I charge for coaching and what I charge for consultancy are very different. Because of course in one aspect I'm physically producing stuff, in another, my husband puts it, what do you do? You go there and sit there all day and talk to them and listen. So, um, <laughs> issues of time, the challenge of this um, business as usual and maintaining rapid growth. So again, one of the key issues that they face very, very quickly as we rework their strategy is that they're all hell for leather to, to start moving things forward, but then realise there's a danger that business as usual might be impacted, and how do we balance that? What do we do? How do we reorganise the team? Do we reorganise the team? Do we look at outsourcing some of our work? All those dynamics start to come in. And then, of course, personalities. I've had interesting reactions, as you can imagine. At one organisation, I went into, for the first time, meet the senior management team after having had three sessions with the chief executive and the managing director, and that's an interesting dynamic in its own right. One of the organisations, the managing director's company, reversed into the chief executive's business. So actually, he was bought out, but to maintain a level of equality, he's retained his title of managing director, so they have an MD and a chief exec and a board of management. It's a lot of top heavy people. But the first time I went to meet the board of management, they sat there and there was a lot of this going on, a lot of suspicion. And then at the coffee break, one of them said to me, you're here to do a rationalization exercise, mm -hmm. aren't you? You're here to work out who goes. And I was like, where the hell has that come from? I've just told you what I'm going to do. Yeah. So a bit like, and then of course the two guys didn't make it any easier because they think it's funny and they said, actually we call her the Grim Reaper. <laughs> I said, well, no, you find that funny, but they're going to go away and all go, oh, she probably is. So, um, in terms, in, in the context of typical models, I guess what, here, in, to give you a bit of grounding, um, I guess my training, if you like, in coaching and mentoring um, began back in the 80s when I was in a position of training. My, my background, my career started in recruitment 
Um, I worked in uh, the Hayes Business Services Group, which was the biggest recruiter at the time. Um, worked my way through the ranks and opened my big fat mouth one day and said, I think training's rubbish. And I, and I could do better, and so they said, go and do it then. The next thing I knew, I was running the training team, and then eventually I was group head of training, and then actually opened two businesses for Hayes around training and mentoring. And so went on various training programs. Um, I was trained as a coach through the Chartered Management Institute. I do a lot still with Chartered Management Institute. Um, and these were the models traditionally that I worked with. Um, and I think they have their place. I'm not a big one for models. I guess as I got older, perhaps, I started to question things and think, well, actually, is it about following a process? No. Or actually, is it more than that? And then I met this lady. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to say much about it. We're together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, it was fortuitous, actually, that you happened to be coming. This wasn't deliberate. Um, but actually, um, J Janice's model, in terms of approach uh, and coaching, actually ha a, a sort of rang a lot of bells with, with me. As it, no, that's not the phrase. What's the word? Where it kind of resonated. sits with you. Resonated. Thank you. Resonated with me. Because to me, and listening to the presentation you did to us on our doctoral programme, um, there is this two-way relationship and it's very much about outcomes, very much about learning and for me in, con in the context of coaching when I set up the coaching relationship with clients I make it clear to them, I want to know what they want out of it of course and that has to drive it but I also make sure they understand that it's not just about me coming in and charging them and my day rate, listening to them, a bit of therapy and going away but actually that we work together and constantly re-evaluate what's going on so that they feel they're getting something tangible and we always work with action plans and I'm sure other people do as well but I guess as I say I'm just sharing my practice with you and the action plans to me are key because I know for a fact that they can see the progress and that to me then demonstrates that I'm still valuable to them. Because we were having an interesting conversation, as you were saying, Janice, you know, coaching just an expensive conversation. And actually, I think there's a danger that it's perceived that way in the business world, particularly at times. Um, so I, I guess I'm always conscious of that and not being seen as just an expensive conversation, which is what my husband thinks I am. Um, so, so coach, and he doesn't really work. Um, coach, mentor, business collaborator. Coaching and mentoring blur, blur, blurred lines. Um, again, probably common to all of you, I find that I'm constantly flipping between coaching and mentoring. At the end of the day, the reason they brought me in is because they feel I have the expertise. I've been through the process myself of setting up a high growth business, of the pains that you go through, um, and the focus on strategy and I understand inside and out how to put strategy together and how to pull it apart. So in the first instance that's why they've brought me in. And what would usually have happened is they would have interviewed three or four coaches and then made their decision. But the feedback I get consistently is actually out of all the coaches measuring you all against each other the difference was your strategic experience. So that's why I'm working with them. And as a result, quite often, we end up in a situation where the questions are being thrown out, but ultimately they say, well, what do you think? Do you think this is right? Do you think this is going to work? And that's where I become this sense checker and sometimes a bit like the third wheel partner, um, which is interesting, again, the confidant, the challenger, challenging what they say. The expert I've put in as a question mark because, of course, if nothing else, my nervousness is there's now a huge legal reason why I shouldn't be the expert, because I cannot be a shadow director. And again, I find with executive level coaching, particularly around something like strategy, being careful about crossing boundaries is critical, because they might go away and make a decision, which could be a bad decision, which could be, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, and I can't give myself too many airs and graces, I'm sure they wouldn't, but they made a decision that caused the business potentially some serious damage. You could argue that they could argue she gave us the advice and then all hell breaks loose. So I will always caveat anything I say, of course, with, well, 
I might think this way, but actually what's more important is what you guys believe you need to do. And are you sense checking with me because you're not confident, or do you genuinely want my opinion? And often it's just that they want to double check, because, you know, that, that bouncing idea and thoughts. This catalyst for change, without exception, I think one of the key benefits that they may not realise, and you may again have experienced with your own clients, is that you, you become that catalyst for change. Things happen, things start to move, and organisations that might be a little bit stuck seem to become unstuck. They get stuck again because, of course, they gain ground with any movement, but then they start to do a bit of a panic or they haven't got the expertise and things slow down again or they have conversations around panic, what do we do, what do we do? And that's where, again, they'll often bring me in. Um, I'm also conscious that they don't become codependent. I've got a situation actually going back to the MDF uh, chief exec organisation where I'll have a meeting with the two of them and they get on famously with each other, but then within an, hour, within an hour of me leaving their offices, the phone will ring, it's the chief executive. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? How do you think I should talk to him about this? How should I talk to him about that? Do you think he should have done this? Do you think he should have said that? And what I'm conscious of is that they don't use me too much as a bit of a crutch. And so I end up throwing it back, of course, and saying, well, what do you think? Why, why are you asking me the question? How would you want it dealt with? How would you want to be dealt with in those sorts of questions? And ultimately, I'm never the owner of the business. So again, constantly reminding myself and reminding them that I'm not there to run their business. And that's critical, that we understand that boundary. And that they need to be able to let go of me whenever. And of course, there's that tussle again. You know, on, it is what I do for my for work. I'm paid to do it. So there's that, of course, that keenness to have ongoing work. But I also recognise that I do not want a situation where I'm going into a client and they turn around and say, "Why actually have we got her here today, and why are we paying for you?" Um, and I think that's always very dangerous. And and again. You can fall into the trap in terms of trying to please by almost running their organisation for them, particularly where strategy is concerned. I talked about this question of where does coaching become consultancy, and, and it really brings me back to setting boundaries. I'm constantly finding that I have to reset, not reset or remind them of the boundaries, because we drift into conversations around, right, what's our action plan? The action plan is this, and actually, Roman, we need help with this. Could you help with that? Let's talk about what we can do here, and you could do there, and blah, blah, blah. And so there are two reasons for me kind of resetting those boundaries. One, because I feel strongly, and again, rightly or wrongly, and please feel free to shout me down, that I need them to understand the difference between when I'm coaching and when I'm doing consultancy work. A, from a charge perspective, but B, also, the relationships are very different. And I feel that's important for them to understand. And it, it works. It seems to work. I, I guess that quite a between when I'm coaching and when I'm doing consultancy work. A, from a charge perspective, but B, also, the relationships are very different. And I feel that's important for them to understand. It works. It seems to work. I, I guess that, quite rightly, probably people would challenge and say, well, should you wear two hats? Is that appropriate? And I can understand that. Um, appropriateness, again, as I say, you know, there are times where I might actually say, I don't think it's appropriate for me to do consultancy in this situation, and I will pass it on to the relevant person. And that's because I need to protect my role as the coach with them, and I know that it might stray into areas that aren't relevant, or, or aren't, are not conducive to them and to me. Um, this issue of value, again, if I stray into consultancy, then do I just become an overhead and therefore is there a danger that we go back to this conversation around why am I paying for this particular service? Um, I talked about dependency. Again, I'm really keen and I reiterate this to all companies that I work with, that the day I walk away from you, 
I want you to be able to be self-sufficient. And my ideal relationship is that, of course, you call on me every so often, but it is every so often. So we look at where you are now, where you want to be, and how you get there also involves what skills do we need to develop in you, your senior management team, and anyone else in the organisation. Um, and closing off, and outcomes and closing off, being clear about where we're heading means that we can measure those outcomes and we can also close off relevant elements of the way in which I'm working with them. So going back to my fashion PR organisation, um, I'm shortly completing my work with them as coach and actually we've just been talking separately about consultancy piece, which takes me down the road of um, management development with their senior management team, but it will be a very separate piece. And, and that closing off, we've even put a date on it, um, has, I guess, psychologically made a difference to both them and me. Okay, so that's it. Charity. Yes, sorry, for my charity. <laughs> I'm contributing my fee to breast cancer care. And that's it. Thank you. That's how I feel as well. So, so then we talked about it, but you know, these are quite difficult, you know, ethical issues for, for practitioner coaches, and you know, where you're being paid mm. to do a job and you're brought in because of your expertise. Mm. Um, and sometimes you can see that more help is needed, it's not the help you're giving. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I'm interested to see what other people think. Yeah, well. I found that what I, I it is this tussle between you, you want the work, but you don't want them to feel like they're paying for nothing. And so I find myself, I do say to them, well, you know, it's great that because they've been, the same line seems to come out, you've got to know us so well, you know our organisation, you know our people, we don't want to bring someone else in, we know you can do the work, will you work with us? So then I throw it back in the context of come up with what you need, you know, you scope out what you think you need, why you need it, because I don't want, Again, if they say yes, I want them to know that they feel they're saying yes because they really see that there's a value to it. Um, so it is kind of a pull. I mean, I don't know, as Janice said, what do other people feel or what are their experiences? The interesting thing is, I mean, you know, when you're doing the business coaching, is you are in a business. Mm -hmm. And so you are a resource to that business. Mm -hmm. And if you are dealing with a good business, you've got to be able to run a good business yourself. And a good business will sniff you out in two seconds yes. as to whether you're going to go and sit there and do nothing. So I think the thing is whether you set yourself up as a person that does good quality business and only wants to work with quality business, that never becomes an issue. What it does become an issue when you're working with poor quality business and they like poor quality people. And you know the two can't really marry. And that's when you have to look at it purely from a business perspective. So if you're coming to the end of actually 
meeting the parameters and, and, and in your goals. And they say, what do we see? That's like you said, you reassess and you go for the project or you bring a resource to, to actually complete that business goal. Now, if you're a good business coach, that can be very scary to some businesses. Because when you say, I've done with you, you're there, I'm walking away and say, don't you want the money? Yes, I could, I could do it forever more, but this is not good for you. So I think that's about how you operate as a business person and a coach, which is the two very different sides to you. I think also the program you're describing there, that would be some that I'm reading that as the growth accelerator program. But some of the principles behind it. Yeah. And I think part of that for me is about the fact, you know, certain ones that are sitting with the government initiative. I think if they set it up with a blurred strap line at the outset, and I think it's very confusing for businesses about whether they're actually receiving a consultant or a coach. Mm -hmm. So I think for you then to step into that space, it's very difficult to hold the space. And I, and I guess my experience of it is having to constantly recontract in the moment, which is what you're describing yeah. there. So you're actually naming it. This is coaching. I can mm -hmm. do this through coaching. What's your goal? And, going into that full contracting position about coaching versus well actually we're stepping out of, of, of the coaching mm. now and actually we're going and despite their energy and their, their desire for growth mm. there are inevitably conflicts of interest and, and tugs at the ethical framework that you're working through as you step in them. And there are strategic tugs. Yeah. I mean you know yeah. sometimes I'm working with one organisation where They've got two sides of the business arguing absolutely blind yeah. that that should drive strategy. Mm -hmm. And then we were sitting in a board meeting a few weeks ago, and I just said, what do your customers want? And the, and the chief exec said, does anyone ask what our customers want? I was thinking, they're really successful. And they haven't asked their customers what they want. <laughs> Welcome to reality. But, yeah. but you know, it's easy it's to true. miss. Yeah, but it's easy to miss that kind of thing. And joking apart, he then said to me in the coffee break, now I know why we pay you. And I thought, well, that was an expensive question, wasn't it? But yeah, as, as you, you know, as you say, you're constantly recontracting. Yeah. And that recontracting I'm finding is critical. And it's exhausting. I come away. I love what I do. Don't get me wrong. I'm passionate about doing it. I really get the buzz out of it. But I go home and I'm exhausted because you're constantly thinking, right? Oh, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where do I sit? And blah blah. And also, you. I, one thing I did put up with there, with a couple of the organisations, we have similar interests at senior level. Only one of those organisations has a female MD, which is interesting. I mm. think it just happens to be that way. Um, she happens to be in fashion, and it's very... Anyway, we, we get on very well. And there's a danger, again, the lines become blurred because you're spending so much time with them, and you're getting into some personal stuff. You become friendly. And there's another issue there, you know, is it appropriate to be friends with them? No. Or is it appropriate to be friends at a later point? You know, professionally, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, it brings in all kinds of interesting dynamics. That I think that I think that's the the role of a coach in it in any kind of organisation, whether it be you know large or small, that you have to be able to juggle your roles, you know, psychologically and in many other ways so well that you can be virtually a lot of things to all people, yes. and that I think is what is demanding of a of a coach. More than even the actual technical skill, mm -hmm. as to when when you play with so many different roles, mm -hmm. it's almost been like chameleon. Mm -hmm. Can I ask um, about supervision? How does that help you, or does it help you through some of these challenges that you have? Um, what supervision of me as a coach? I don't have supervision. Um, what what? What perspective were you? I think the answer is you don't have it. I think that's it. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking, was there an interesting point? No. No. Well, good question. No, I haven't. Um, I, I know other coaches who I'll talk to about things. Um, but no, I don't. Can it's I, an interesting just point. Just touch on the point, uh, the, the blurring point between the coaching and the consulting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing consulting to a very large client uh, 
And then we now want to repeat stage where I've realized that they don't need consulting, they need coaching mm -hmm. because there's a knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. So the question that came back was, what would be the fee, how many mandates would, you know. And it's very difficult to yeah. give a, a, a reasonable answer on that because yeah. uh, theory there's a knowledge gap. Yeah. And I may spend five minutes, I may spend one hour, depends on whether the message gets through or not. Yes. Yeah. Um, which will probably result in consulting because mm -hmm. then the question will be now you know now you know the problem, help us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the fee charging aspect really becomes quite a challenge. Yeah. Because you can't parcel it up into mm -hmm. you know and how do you I'm, do I find that the hardest and actually I you know I've always worked in environments when my twenty years I worked in the city of London, never had a problem with negotiation. Um, when you're doing it for yourself, it's so difficult because you find yourself thinking, oh, should I ask them that much? And, and I do find that I price coaching differently to consultancy, but even then, it's a case of working out, well, hang on a minute, as you say, what size of work are we looking at when it comes to consultancy? You know, if it's that you're going to be going in and doing a bit of work all the time, a motion study to really evaluate what needs to be done and then you're going to go away and do the preparation for it there might be some training off the back of it off the back of that there may be one-to-one -one sessions and a follow-up then what I try to do is loosely I base it on a minimum of 250 a day um, but it could be upwards of that depending on where I'm going to be you know quite candidly City of London will pay significantly more than Hertfordshire and if I'm dealing as it happens, I'm not dealing with very small businesses, but if I was, then even 250 a day is a lot of money. So I tend to be as fair as I can. Um, in a way, it sounds stupid, in a way it would be great if someone just paid me the money and I could go in and do it for free, if, if that makes sense. Because then I don't have the issue around that. Really I know. <laughs> a special person that comes and puts money in the bank. to get him on for Sorry? Consultant. Um, well, but you know, um, I have a friend who's a dentist and he sells to customers, you know, things like really expensive veneers and, mm -hmm. and he was saying he went on a course cause he's, uh, to, to, about ethical selling. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a common concept in business, ethical selling? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's very so, much so. It sounds yeah. like coaches, it would be great if coaches have a sort of a session on ethical selling. It and would, we, we but do you know, know you do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know what's interesting <laughs> though? I think when it comes well, to call the ethics and ethical selling. Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. again, I think approach is interesting because I've met, I'm sure everyone has, there are coaches that I feel I have a lot of respect for, and there are coaches that I've come across who do the, I've made millionaires out of people, and I my charge out rate is minimum £3,000 a day, and blah, blah, blah. And they just, I sort of think, well, that's great, but where's the client in all of this? It's all me, 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 me. And I think we were talking about this earlier. I think the biggest issue with coaching, per se, is a coach could be any number of things. In a way, I sometimes wonder, am I actually a coach? Do you, do you know what I mean? It's, sorry, go on. Yeah, very much to ask. The consultant, presumably, you involved in the business for a good deal of some period of time, yes. a number of years. Yes. And in that way, I, I kind of, the thought that occurred to me is that possibly you're limiting your effectiveness as a coach because you were there for such a long time and there's confidentiality issues and like there's conflict of interest mm -hmm. and, and also how people actually get to see you and you, you know, yes. it, it must be something that's crossed your mind too. Yes. Um, the first thing to say is if I'm there for over a period of years, they tend not to be the consultancy clients. They'll be the coaching clients, and I'll be typically I'll be going in every six months, three to six months. Um, and I suppose it's a combination of coaching and mentoring. Um, with the consultancy clients, it will be around a very specific piece, and and usually it's around management development. And typically, it's been a case of you know because we've grown so fast and we've gone, gone through all that growth, we've got these managers in place, but they've never actually had any formal development. So I'll work with them. I, I use, I'm a fan of DISC. I use DISC, I put them through extended DISC training, uh, training assessment. 
and then we, we work one to one and then we work in a group and I do some management development with them. So it tends to be that I'll dip into a project where appropriate. But I agree, you know, there is this whole, I've, traditionally I've done more consultancy, even though I've trained in coaching, the majority of coaching and mentoring that I did was in-house in corporate environments. So it was at senior management level with managers. Then I moved into um, running my own business and then actually I moved into business support. And it was in the context of business support that I found myself being pulled into, well, you, you know, you've done a lot of coaching and you go and speak to these particular clients. And at that stage, because it was government supported, the solution was a free solution. Um, and it kind of went from there and then I've had companies contact me and I guess because I've been in the high growth environment, it's kind of mushroomed from there. Um, so yes, I've got a combination of clients that have come to me from specific initiatives and others that have been referred by other companies, which is really nice. Um, but this blurring of lines is an interesting one. It does scare me a bit at times. That's why I find, I have to say, for all the training that I've had, a lot of it in, re in real world terms for me has been about feeling my way and, and contracting with the client, very much so. And I would say as a result, the relationships have all been quite different. I don't know if any of those don't know how to do it or selling it yeah. in terms of I'm, what springs to my mind is like coaching and content. Right. So if it's coaching and content free between that's what the topic is, it's about right. having yes. people realise their ambitions yes. and set their targets and achieve them. But um, what it feels to me that you're offering is that coaching but with some additional content. Yeah. So there'll be you know, input around strategic areas. Yeah. So if you're upfront about that, then you can choose whether to like it or not. Yeah, and in fact, actually, you're probably hitting the nail on the head because nine times out of ten, one of the things I do with the awards is a strategy day where we'll take their business plan and we'll turn it upside down and inside out with a view to testing it. Um, again, quite often they'll walk away with a slightly different plan. So there is content in that respect. Is that coaching? Is that training? Is that mentoring? Is that consultancy? Well, I find it interesting because you're, you're talking about, I think you picked up there, you're talking about one to one work with like the. Initially with the principal. Yeah. And, and then do you carry on with that one to one work whilst you're then working with the board, like more people in this family house? Just to some extent, what's tended to happen is they've wanted me to support them in dealing with the rest of the board. And then because we're looking at strategy and the board are involved in strategy, I'll work with them as a collective on so strategy. As a professional, would you describe that as group coaching? Or what do you describe that as when you're... I'm just interested. Yeah, when, you're when, I'm talking talking to the client, when you're yeah. with the yeah. whole board, because... I, yeah. I talk about it, well, I talk about it as brainstorming. Yeah. Strategic so it's more sort of like, Facilitation. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think this is another, you'll face all sorts of interesting areas because um, there's no research at all on group coaching. You know, that's, you know, it doesn't really exist you know, as a, a model, a theory, a concept. It's just a sort of idea and perhaps a language that some people use. And the reason, in my view, the kind of coaching world that I think of as a failure the top is because people can't tell the difference. Between group coaching and group facilitation, mm -hmm. you know, there's even a, there's, I think there's a professional institute of group facilitation. Mm -hmm. Someone was telling me about the election, mm -hmm. the next election. Um, so there's something about, you know, which is interesting itself, really. So there's there's a group of people that see that as a profession, you know, a professional field in the sense mm -hmm. of, you know, group yeah. facilitation. So, and I suppose for me, if I worked with boards of trustees, I mean, I maybe work in the charitable sector. So if I work with boards of trustees, I call it um, group coaching because I'm a coach. Mm. So what I bring is me as the coach. Mm. Um, I've never seen myself as a group facilitator. It's not something I've ever done in my business. It's you know I've I've managed teams mm. and you know and run team meetings. But, and it's so interesting when you start putting labels on things. Yeah. You know because actually at the end of the day, all you're doing is bringing yourself. And you're bringing your skills, your knowledge, your expertise, your way of working mm -hmm. into a situation. Mm -hmm. Now, putting charge into one side, I think, like you said, it's a completely different issue about ethics and you know how you sit mm -hmm. with the client, etc. But 
just in terms of your, you know, what you, how you're developing as a professional, you're really just bringing yourself, aren't you? Mm. So whatever, what well, are you saying that you're applying? Are you going in um, consciously applying different skills, knowledge and expertise when you yes. work with a group? Or are you just going in and I, doing yourself? No, I think I'm consciously applying the knowledge and skills, but I feel myself moving between the different mm. hats, as it were. But finding myself, I'm really interested in thinking about it, I rarely refer to myself as a coach when I'm with them. And I don't know whether that's I don't value myself as a coach, or whether it's because I feel that actually I'm probably, because it's strategy and because we, we start with the question, how valid is our business plan in the context of competitive advantage, which is typical, then I'm almost driving it, so I'm driving the questions. And to me, coaching, as we've said before, is very much about you almost not being passive, but allowing them, helping mm -hmm. them draw mm -hmm. things out. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I am helping them to elicit the answers, but in a different way. And that's not really coaching. It is a combination of facilitation, mentoring, maybe, I don't know, business expert. I don't know what you would call it. But I think it's interesting that you were saying earlier on about you know, people say what is a coach. I said to me, you know, to make a yeah. And I think for the clients, it's so important that you, like you were saying, can define mm -hmm. what it is you're offering in different circumstances mm -hmm. and what that what that outcome will be. Because so many businesses, big, small, you know, whatever, get so confused with this because these you know, generic terms are really baffling people. But for instance, I'm a coach, a trainer, and a consultant. And I'll do all three in an organisation that I'm using a completely different knowledge and skill set. Well, do you know what's interesting? Yeah. I think what I found businesses are quite cynical. Yes, they are. Coaches. <laughs> it's like they see it as Paul McKenna stuff. Well, there's, a, there's another side to that as well because I have deliberately put my coaching practice through the growth accelerator program. So, so you know, it's at the smaller end, obviously, of growth. It's not the multi-million pound end, but it's at the small end. But what I find really, really frustrating when I meet with my coach is that they keep consulting and they keep mentoring me. And actually what they're not doing is giving me my space and my time to do my thinking with my coach. So your own business going through coaching? Yeah. Uh, so I happen to be an executive coach as well. Uh, and I've deliberately taken my business to the yeah. accelerator program right. to test out what I would get because I just thought that'd be fun to do. Ah, okay. And it's proving so. And oh, you're it's proving you're so not... frustrating. Yes, so you're, <laughs> saying, <laughs> you're saying your coach is not giving you the space well, he is, but through consultancy and mentoring, and next to no coaching. But do they not? Do they not ask you how you feel it's going, or what? I can't imagine not every single time I engage with them, mm -hmm. making sure that they're happy with what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and I, it wouldn't. It truly wouldn't be fair to say I'm not getting anything from it. Mm -hmm. But am I getting from it what I thought was on the team when I enrolled into it? So that's, it? I guess, what no. I'm saying. And that's, and and that's, that's also different. That's the definition yeah. with the client. Yes. Yeah. And there's always a huge educational piece when yeah. you do what we do yeah. to clients that are in, because there's many different experiences. Yeah. And being able to define yourself or your business or your organisation and what you provide is critical for your success and being able to help clients. Because I'd much prefer him to, you know, on, on, a, on a given day go, right, let's see, actually, you're bonkers. And what I'm going to do today is a bit of consultancy on strategy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or actually... You can tell the phone to me. You know, to be... I mean, actually, I don't, I don't think I do need it on a strategy. No, I think were, I need yeah, it on yeah, other things, yeah. which is why I bought into it. But, yeah. but I don't... Because he blurs those boundaries right. so much, okay. I find that so frustrating. Okay. And, I, and I certainly don't get coaching in, in terms of how I've been trained to coach as a professional coach. And I find that really interesting. You know, I'm not, not picking on you at all. It's interesting who they've brought into the programme as yes, coaches. Yes, and that, that goes back to what we're saying about, you know, have you asked your customers? Do they get 
time feedback. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what, what are we doing as coaches to get that feedback? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of aware we've got to about 10 more minutes. So I just thought for any people who haven't had a say, if they mm -hmm. wanted to, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there might be, if anybody wants to in the last few minutes to say anything particularly. Could I just ask a question? Yeah. The bit that fascinated me was the action plan. You mentioned that that's key. Well, I think when you move towards an action plan, that's you sort of perhaps blaring the, the 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 area where you're going into perhaps consultancy. Well, what I mean by action plan is I think it's really important that they feel they've got. So we'll always review after a day what happened today and what did they get out of the day mm -hmm. and what needs to happen next if they're going to make it all effective. Because to me, there's no point me going in there and they come away thinking, oh, that was a lovely day and that was very so useful. This is a group. Well, it could be with the group, it could be with the individual. Right. We always, we all, I always work out, I always get them to feed back to me and to themselves what it is they've got out of the day and what needs to happen next. And that's what I mean by an action plan. So that it's clear to them that they're carrying things on. Because again, I don't want to feel that I'm going in there and things happen when I'm there, but when I'm gone, it's kind of, oh, well, back to business as usual. Otherwise, where's the value in having someone working with them? And then what's really great is the next time we meet again, and usually in between as well, they usually update me, and actually it's become habitual. They, I find they'll email me on a regular basis and say, oh, this has happened and that's happened, and then we do a review again. How far have you come since the last time we met? And that, to me, is then helping them and me understand that we're going in the right direction and they're achieving what they need to. Well, but what's the difference between management and consultancy and what you do? So what's the difference between them ringing up and then? Um, so, I don't, again, you know, people call themselves management consultants, change managers, coaches, mentors, whatever. Uh, interestingly, my clients, if they ever introduce me to anyone, they'll always say, oh, this is Rowan, she's my mentor. And I say, why do you call me your mentor? I'm not. But just as a point of interest, that they label me in that way, which I find fascinating. But then again, it's a label, isn't it? Mm. You know, what do you call one, one last one. comment? I think we've got one last thing. Give it up. Stick to lecturing. No, you told us that you love it. I do love it. Talk with people who might think loving me. Give it up, love. <laughs> 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 results you know in health <laughs> and I thought this person is running this whole show of this is their catalog results this is five years ago so now we know why we may have some problems mm -hmm. <laughs> got the best of trends. <laughs> well I was gonna say thank you again to Brenda because that was fantastic <laughs> Tuesdays. 
Janice is here. She is, will be running your when is yours, Janice? 30th of April. We've got, we've got two in April. We've got Kevin in April 16th. We've got one in May. Um, so if you're interested in football and how that might be, they're all quite different. And um, Vinny is coming and talking about solution focus on the 18th. So um, that's what I wanted to share with everybody. Anybody else got anything they'd like to tell us about that would be, you would like to hear about? No? Anybody running in courses? Yeah, is anybody more interested in um, uh, line management? Just one observation, really. Um, <clears throat> turning to the story you were just saying about, you know, running a show without any, any vision, as it were. Oh, uh, understanding. Yeah. Or understanding. Yeah. Uh, I, I do courses for the IOD, and uh, ah. so um, I always have uh, finance directors come to me uh, for training, and uh, it's amazing how many don't understand the meaning of the word strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can mm -hmm. tell you currently there's a huge debate going on in IOD saying, will somebody please understand strategy? I mean, how many times do we have to go out there and explain to corporates, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that tough, really. So there's a lot of companies out there. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, because I teach strategy here as well, mm -hmm. it takes me back to basics every week, which is great. I teach final year undergrad and postgraduate. Mm -hmm. and I'll then go out and use the models I work with. Clearly, I won't name the models because they'll think I'm a bit mad. Yes. But it's amazing how many organisations will say, wow, what an amazing perspective. I didn't think about that. I'm thinking, I do that with final year undergrad. <laughs> and it's not rocket science, and I didn't invent it. But it's that perspective. And funny enough, one of the organisations, the finance director, I said to him, go on an IOD course. And he went recently on three day one. Oh, and he yes. said it was brilliant. Yes. And Exactly as you say, and came back and he said, I get what you're saying now. And he's a really competent finance director. Mm. But, yeah. We're educating a new generation of strategists. Well, you, it's, it's worrying, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> older than you. Uh, and, and I left you here in university, and I, I tell the students that what you're learning, you can take it back. Yes. So don't use the Quarters, five no, years. they all love that. <laughs> Nobody yeah. will. No, no one will know what we're talking about. But talk about competitive advantage, talk about sources yes. of competition, blah, blah, blah. Of course they understand. And in fact, when I talk about effectively quarters to five quarters, that's the one that most companies are like, gosh, you know, we haven't thought of it from that perspective. Oh, yeah. And I think, well, I wish I was a millionaire like Michael Porter. That would be great. <laughs> 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 okay. We'd be pleased to know your students talk about that more than other. Yeah, they just try and fit it into anything, that's why they shoehorn it in, because they understand that well. Well, thanks ever so much, and thank you to all of you for coming out this evening, and hope to see you at some of the other events that we have coming up, and uh, safe journey soon. See you soon.